good morning uh, welcome to the 29th annual program for this for senior executives on leading india to excellence uh, held at the national institute of advanced studies bangalore my name is chidambaran and i am one of the coordinators of this program uh, to just briefly uh, uh, start about nias uh, the national institute of advanced studies was founded in 1988 in pursuit of shri jrd tata's vision of an institution that would help create new leadership in all sections of the society this program that uh, the uh, annual program for senior executives is the cornerstone on which nias builds its efforts to develop an effective and sensitive leadership in india our distinguished participants are senior executives with a wide range of experiences we would like to welcome all our distinguished participants of the 29th program to nias and the program in, in particular this pro this program is designed as a series of interactive encounters with in inspiring thinkers across the country uh, so in this inaugural session we are fortunate and indeed privileged to hear shri k venkatramanan ceo and md of larsen and tubro whom we would like to heartily welcome to our institute welcome sir uh, may i now request our director dr baldev raj to kindly give us the welcome address thank you good morning and Welcome to you all, Mr. K. Venkatramanan. We are really delighted that you are here to interact with the participants. As my colleague uh, Chidambaram mentioned, GRD Tata was indeed a holistic visionary who had grown as one of the foremost. leaders of the country not only in industry but the complete perspective of the country in his mind he thought that there is no institute in the country where the challenges of the country can be addressed by bringing social scientist specialists from humanity science and technology policies people who can manage the conflict of interests and who can look ahead he was inspired by french ecole superior system that the leaders are born at the cross sections of the disciplines and by the interactions with the best minds though these things look very simple and one would have thought that it would have been a cake walk for jrd tata to create an institute like that he is doing it in the interest of the country and he is ready to spend his time but none of the visionary outlooks are easy to implement they look so natural when you look at it 10 20 30 50 years later on however the fact is that he overcome all the challenges and created this beautiful institute and brought some of the best minds from india to work together and as i go through the history they didn't come here for money they were all paid very little amount of money but they came for the love of the country and to work with the inspiring leadership of jrd tata and dr raja ramana who was the founder director of this institute in fact the first program for the senior executive started with dr raja ramana giving the welcome address and jrd tata giving the inaugural address and you can see the kind of people who came i can give you one example that mr boom b muthuraman who was the managing director of tata steel and later on the vice president of the tata sons he was one of the participants in the senior executive program we have interacted with about 500 senior executives in this program and i think about uh, 200 eminent personalities would have come to interact with these people who came it is very clear from the kind of interaction which you have that you would get many tipping points and many things to ponder which should 
inspire you to go to the next level of your leadership and contribute to the country. Of course, when we meet at periodic intervals and when we meet on 24th, it would be your echoes and reflections which are very important for us as to how you found this course to be useful and what you are taking back after interacting with these people. Even on the first day, as I was going through the program, I find that you are going to listen to Mr. K. Venkatramanan, a remarkable leader of the engineering industry in the country. Mr. N. Santosh Hagde, on the moral values and consequences thereof, and then you are going to listen to Sharat Chandra Lele on the environment and challenges ahead. It's just the first year program. And you would also listen to some other outstanding people. In fact, each one is very carefully chosen who have remarkably good demonstration of the effortless leadership today, which is accepted. So it's not very easy that in a life of five or six days, you come across people like that who can really share their experiences, who can have a cup of coffee with you, who can talk to you, you can talk to them and maybe establish your lifelong relation with them. So I'm very confident that uh, the NIAS would gain, you would gain and more important, the country would gain out of that. What makes the leader is a question which continues to be discussed and repeated. Everybody has an explanation and I have also an explanation, however incomplete it may be. Leaders are the ones who have the purpose in life. They have a meaning in life. They, like many others, don't look at themselves. They look at a cause and they look at the country, they look at the world as their arena. For them, the challenges are the opportunities. For them, the bigger the challenge, bigger the failure, they demonstrate that the success would be equally bigger. Recently, I was uh, reading about a person who spent many, many years in Nazi camps. His name is Viktor Frankl. While everybody gave way and he says that one sign of the leadership in those camps was that whether you accept the defeat or you stay optimistic to be able to be able to one day walk out of this and with your mind and experiences do something remarkable. This guy, Victor E. Frankl, is considered as one of the foremost psychologists and is in comparison with Sigmund Freud and all that, he has made contributions of that in the University of Vienna. So you imagine the leadership does not come easy. The essay about leadership is so rational that all of us feel that we could be leader of outstanding importance. Another person you look at about whom you are all very familiar is Stephen Hawking. The kind of challenges to this theoretical physicist in life and what he is achieving and what he has achieved and his passion for life to be able to contribute to the world and coming up with altogether revolutionary thinking even saying that artificial intelligence can destroy the world. We can discuss it, whether he is right or wrong, but the kind of the leadership he can provide to the whole world is remarkable. So I think we have to look at that when we are bestowed with many of the qualities, many of you have come from the organizations which are very premier cutting edge organizations. You have come from industry, you come from government, you come from defense forces, strategic departments. In all these environments, what is it which is stopping you from outstanding leadership? I hope this uh, interaction for six days in this course would be, would be very useful. 
one thing more i should mention over here is that senior executive program because it was envisaged by jrd tata it is something which is at the core of the uh, nyas the gardener even knows that on 19th you are going to be in this institute so when i talked to him two months back he was planting the roses i said you are planting the rose uh, plants now you have taken out the old ones why you are doing it now he says no sir when the 16th our senior executive come these plants would be at the best of the bloom and you can really see i was today morning getting down from the car and looking at that the roses are at the first bloom almost every plant you would find as if it has been designed to blossom when you are there for these 6 days so that's a kind of a commitment which nyas has for this senior executive program so i wish you wonderful time i'd be all these 6 days here i would not be moving out of campus i would be your enabler along with chidambara mayer anything you have to discuss in your spare time and uh, you would like the connectivity or anything to be made available to you connectivity i am not talking in terms of wifi or internet with respect to the leaders you would like to interact with in your work program what you would like to do what you would like nyas to be as an enabler to you in a sense you become the alumni of nyas and we have always a relation with the people who come and stay here for this program so you are like a family now in nyas and we would like to take care of you as family member as i mentioned mr k venkatramanan we are very fortunate that he has agreed to come and give the inaugural address our all the programs are interactive so with the permission of mr k venkatramanan at the end of it please feel free to interact with him and ask him whatever clarifications and suggest whatever you would like to say about the aspect because he is going to speak on a subject which is today at the core of the leadership of india which is at the core of the challenge of india and nobody can be better than mr k venkatramanan who has spent all his life in manufacturing mr k venkatramanan is a graduate in chemical engineering and iit delhi he is the distinguished alumni awardee of iit delhi he is credited with the transformation of lnt from a fabrication driven company to a technology led driven player it can be demonstrated that if you look at the programs of atomic energy space defense petrochemical fertilizer food many of the programs all over the world lnt is at the center and mr k venkatramanan is one of the architect and he spent all his life and i think this is one another characteristics of the leaders that today like a common mode of going and shifting the job a few years i have seen most of the leaders have great love for their organizations have great love for their countries they are not looking at self interest they create the opportunities in the companies which they choose carefully and then build those companies or organizations to those stages it can be said about homi baba it can be said about vikram sarabhai it can be said about any great leader anywhere in the world so i think you have to love your organization to be the leader he has uh, uh, been recognized in number of ways in a very unique ways he has been the first asian to be appointed chairman of the board of the directors of engineering and construction risk institute he has been also the recipient uh, of the recognition from the world's most reputed body in chemical engineering namely the institute of chemical engineering uk and the honors go on and on he has uh, varied interests his reading ranges from contemporary business literature to the levity of pg roadhaus an ardent sportsman he is as much at home on the tennis and badminton courts as on the cricket pitch a technology lover a technology practitioner and he is keen to encourage the growth and development of young engineering talent he has been the chief executive officer and managing director 
since April 1, 2012. You would agree with me that it's very difficult to have somebody more suitable for the forum about which we are talking. I have known him from many perspectives. Of course, many of the challenges which we face in the technology areas, K. Venkatramanan is the guru. He has a way of solving the challenges, which later on looks easy, but when you are going through, it uh, is a tremendous work to do it. He is humble to the core, but humble with the self-esteem and the confidence which a leader has. Like you, I am keenly looking forward to listen to Mr. K. Venkatramanan. Mr. K. Venkatramanan. Good morning, Dr. Baldev Raj and the distinguished participants, ladies, Professor Neelakantan. Well, first of all, uh, it's a great privilege to be here in this uh, cerebral atmosphere and in this audience. Well, I have a good connection with Bangalore. I was born here. My maternal grandfather and my mama and my mother all grew up here. And so is my wife from Bangalore. So it's a great pleasure to be here. I would uh, like to just link up a hot topic of today with the type of background that I have seen through my personal association with another great company like the Tata companies that's Larsen and Tubro. Because I have joined from campus, went abroad, came back, but really I worked right through LNT from the time it was a three and a half crore company to a thirteen billion dollar company that it is today. <coughs> Basically when we started in the late 60s, India had a mission at that time of self-reliance. So it, most of us joined, who uh, continued to work in India or came back, worked in that era, which was somewhere with the mid-60s to, I would say, late 70s, early 80s. It was clear. So the national laboratories were set up. Good institutions came up, both in public sector like BHL. Even other good issues like H.C. Ranchi, but didn't come up, but it was set up with a lot of, and so also Bell, and so also so many great uh, public sector and private sector like Tata's and LNT and Detron, Godrej, and so on. So basically, there was a clarity that uh, you got to be self reliant, and the collaborations were there for certain time to stay and not for perpetuality. And that is how. While it was the toughest time in terms of industrial licensing, and we being a private company, we're not allowed to enter more normal fields, like we couldn't enter power sector in coal because BHL was already licensed. We couldn't enter in some parts of process plant because BHPV was already there. But then, as he mentioned, there were visionaries like Baba and there was visionary like Sarabhai and there was our own founders, Mr. Hoke Larson and Mr. Tupro who were both chemical engineers. And they were able to catch on when today we are talking of making India. These were two foreigners who came to India to commission a cement plant, liked India, stayed back because of the war. But they got into manufacturing earlier than even any of the so-called multinationals got in, who were already there in a big way in India. So that is how, because it was considered more technology oriented, and you had people like Bhava, we entered with young engineers who came in from IITs and other good colleges with the support that we got from the founders and from the other people there at that time at senior level, straight away into process plant fabrication instead of going through structural fabrication like all the companies did in the Calcutta era, which was the era of our main initial uh, fabrication industry. And then on to nuclear and space way back in the late 60s. And whatever we learned from there is what we later on, as the economy opened up and we were allowed to do many things, we were able to apply in a big way in the process plant area 
in the offshore platforms area and more recently in the big of the last 13 14 years with drdo in defense so basically this is i mean a company that really uh, fought against all odds uh, in terms of not being denied many things but continued looking at even some bigger areas and came up and that is how the products of what we are all today in this great company are too. So what I will do is, I'll just try to now take you through what is driving again the research. I think somewhere around 82, 83 onwards, India lost track in terms of the new, almost all the national laboratories started coming down in, in Josh. In the fabrication uh, manufacturing also started not having that aura and also one good thing that happened is uh, in the when we opened up it also coincided with the indian it renaissance and really as i always say we must thank them because really it is not only information technology it established indian talent and in india today and gave a different reach because earlier in our time people who went abroad established a brand more in technology as good teachers, professors, scientists abroad came back, did the similar work. But in the mass scale, for the common person to feel the effect around the western part of the world, it is IT who went in thousands and who established the SOC brand. And I think that has helped all other areas also because as we today we export 70% of our heavy engineering equipment abroad. Even our exporting for the ITER program, very critical state-of-the-art technology abroad to Paris as part of that. So basically it gave a lot of uh, what I would call perception change abroad that you could also export, you could also manage projects abroad with Indian leadership as distinct from being part of an international team. So I think today, thanks to a new Josh coming to Narendra Modi's uh, leadership and the government and India also realizing uh, that there is a lot to be done in terms of taking advantage of a demographic dividend. You can't just, you'll have anarchy in this country 20, 15 years from now if the 50 million, 60 million, 70 million people are not gainfully engaged. So the driving factors, of course, in all this is the domestic demand. We are blessed with that. And that is the drive. China is what it is because of domestic demand. America is what it is because of domestic demand. And I think later on, every country that became Japan, it started with a lot of domestic demand. So we have a great domestic demand. And around the world, in the geopolitical sense, India was always important, but somehow, I think now, the way the brand is being sold, India is also a more powerful country than what it was many years ago. So the, there are alternatives in search for higher, better quality, better uh, you know, investment. We have on paper some of the best uh, legal systems. It doesn't get implemented. But there's so much of change happening in all this, in promises, so it will happen. And very important, it has to go along with skill development. Hardly 2% of our uh, force is really trained. I mean, in a good company like Tata's or Mahindra's or LNT, they're trained, but that all that's 2%. So again, a few years ago, this concept of National Skill Development Corporation was launched. Various verticals were formed. I myself lead the vertical on capital goods, where we have formed the Capital Goods uh, Skill Development Council, where we get funding from the government, funding from industry. You won't believe it, but I also didn't know that, that there is no national occupants, uh, occupational standards existing. We have been in manufacturing for, I don't know, from 1900. So now each of these verticals is generating through in interaction with the industry, the occupational standards and the skill uh, qualifications. The whole idea is like we all educated in engineering or even in diplomas, and we have a certificate so people can know you learnt all this, therefore you can be employable. There is no such scheme except when people get trained 
the LNT apprentice scheme or Tata apprentice scheme and they leave uh, because we can't take all of them who are trained as per the Apprentice Act. Other companies just pinch, pinch them because they know they've got this training of four years. But there's no such integrated scheme across the country. And one of the important areas where Mr. Ramadurai is also one of the key persons at the apex level on the skill development is to establish and in this now there is a lot of need for train the trainers, a lot of new companies and skill training are coming up like how NIIT and all came up for uh, computer oriented stuff. The field is open now for a lot of new skill training institutes that are coming up and for curriculums to be made because the new in the old days we had over many thousand ITIs when we were young. Today the whole manufacturing skill requirement has changed. It has become more mechatronics, more electronics oriented, more smart and therefore the new curriculum has to meet that. You can't have and the most important part is when you want by 2022 to train 50 million people as the economy moves from a predominantly services or agriculture economy to also a manufacturing economy. You need <coughs> a lot of trainers and a lot of skills because finally the major employment comes from SMEs and MSMEs. Big companies act as the fountainhead but real employment generator is this next level. And obviously big companies have thousands of vendors whom I call partners in progress whether it is BHL or whether it is Tata or Telco or BEL, we all work through this chain. And unfortunately over the last 10-14 years, most of them have died. Died may not, may not have physically died, but they have become of very low uh, levels of uh, production. And maybe their next generation doesn't even want to do that. But they have been all hurt because of the fact that once you have a poor infrastructure, no power or power at high cost running on diesel, and then you have no growth, then you have so many regulations and issues and corruption and governance. So many people say, why should I do this? The next generation in them say, I'd rather do something else. So basically, that chain will get opened up through the skill development and through this growth. And finally, that is the greatest employer in terms of numbers to take advantage of our demographic uh, dividend. And the other important part is <clears throat> today one good thing that has happened, India has become the engineering back house for the world. So, but today all that engineering, a good part of it is done for products which we again buy back afterwards from them. Although the brain part may have been done either in Bangalore or in Hyderabad or in Bombay or in New Bombay or wherever it is. So I think so there is that, that latent numbers are there. Once there is a major thrust in foreign direct investment, which I think Mr. Modi is good at captions. And one of the things I liked about his is first develop India. That's what FDI means. That's exactly what happens in Malaysia and happens in China and happens that they say you do the value add here. We'll make it very economical for you, but make it here and then export or make it here and then consume. So I think that is going to help, uh, you know, in terms of generating employment because it will be the, what we are short of is capital as a country and therefore we do need foreign direct investment for international companies to also come here get in manufacturing with and take it forward in employment and in also exports and domestic but basically the value add we are the only country that moved from a highly idealistic manufacturing country to a trading country in 15 years 20 years because we opened all the doors from high duties to low duties, at the same time everybody went signing all sorts of direct agreements on without realizing the impact. And we have landed where over the last 10 years more, it's more smarter to trade and become dalals here than to become manufacturing people here. So I think that will change in terms of things. And one good part is during this period, even though there may be not such rapid growth, good quality branding has happened for Indian products abroad in many areas and therefore it's not that people have a, I mean obviously people are still concerned like they are careful 
but it is accepted and it is competitive. But to be competitive for tomorrow, it is no longer low cost. It is really to have those triple bottom line clearly. And that is quality, delivery, competitiveness and sustainability in terms of safety, in terms of your governance, in terms of your various other important points which becomes, let us say, negative for export. And going forward, it will even be more tough. So, and people genuinely are searching for an alternative. Although I think what we will be good at is not necessarily exactly what the Chinese were good at, but that's a topic of discussion. So, if I look back, I entered this industry in the late 60s. If you look back, basically, I mean, this, this is how most good companies grew in more the area of the capital goods sector. I am taking it more in that area. That's the area I know first hand. It applies everywhere. That is, it started in import substitution. We had the era of direct general of technical development, DGTD, and they said, you must make it here. And that is how initially everybody says, I'll import. And generally, the culture of many business houses, especially private, and always is that why should I take a risk? I'll like to import it and so on and so forth. The next, I think, I must recognize the area that gave strength to Indian science, gave strength to Indian manufacturing, gave strength to Indian pride and good companies is the nuclear and ISRO part. I mean, and later on, Dr. Abdul Kalam's integrated guided missile development program, DRDO, and that whole area. Sometimes I feel sad. He's my, I mean, IIT mate, Avinash Chandra, the way the last part has been handled. Because finally, it is very tough to develop something and sell to your own sister unit. We ourselves, it's easier for in us, if you can make a product, sell it to ONGC. Try to sell it inside to some sister group that will, because people are more demanding when it is internally. So it is against all odds, I would say, that DRDO has done what they have done. And they have built a scientific platform. Probably project management part, probably speed, delivery, those are areas which will come automatically in more. But they have been, along with the BRC nuclear park operation and the ISRO, really the mainstay of whereby a lot of good people didn't run away and become computer programmers, but they are investment bankers. But they went with topping their classes, went into this area of manufacturing or infrastructure. Otherwise, as we jokingly say, of course, partly the fault maybe of this industry. It has not highlighted its own role models. It's not highlighted and branded as some other industries have done who came in later. But today, most people obviously, without properly getting the perception of it, and anyway, having the country having gone to sleep for some 15 years. The, what we call joking, ACPC, ACPC culture. That's what the youngster would want. I don't blame him. Air condition and with a computer. That's what we call AC. Who, who would want to go and work in the shop floor? And who would want to go to site? But then we, manufacturing and Indian development won't go without building a trillion dollar plus uh, economy. I mean, Mr. Modi talks, why can't it be many trillion? But even one trillion is a big challenge today. Because finally, the overall cost of anything is only 30, 40 percent at the factory level. It is the total supply chain, logistics, transportation, power, water, uh, housing for people to stay comfortably close by, so on and so forth. That makes the total cost. So I think that, therefore when I say manufacturing, it has to be, it will be coupled with the smart cities concept, with labor laws, with uh, taxes to be easy. I mean, very difficult to understand Indian tax even for people who have grown up. That's the only barrier today to prevent too many foreigners to come and compete against Indian companies. Because it's too complicated even for us. So for them it is Greek and Latin. But it will all be changed now. And therefore, with a combination of infrastructure, more digital India, as he says, to do things online and to reduce this, because finally corruption and governance improves more through systems and processes rather than just lectures. So I think this 
whole fundas of how it has been presented is absolutely very good. And I'm sure that all of us have pride as a country to make it happen this time because this is really a very great opportunity that has come. And then we migrate into the higher end. Because compared to many countries, when there are good companies here who do really the higher end. In, in the defense and other areas, there are small companies in Hyderabad and Bangalore who do very highly technical stuff at the high end, although they may be very small. So basically, whether it's a company or whether it's a country, because finally a country is built by individual organizations. It's not that the country can be different in ethos and the companies can be totally different. So basically, you need a very creative, enabling ecosystem. And the other area which is going to be important, tomorrow's battle in manufacturing, or even today's battle, but is not on cost only. It is on productivity, it's on innovation. And if companies have remained for over 70 years, like our company, who, giving dividend every year, growing into newer areas, it's only because innovation, empowerment of people, meritocracy, giving a pact for knowledge also, while you also have to create value for the shareholder in terms of profitability, has to be there. And I think that is the enabling ecosystem, which I think is going to be one of the important things that will get created in this country now. And it has to go along with talent and skill development because you have to, in the old days, people just were employing people and thinking low cost. If you pay the guy very low and you think therefore you're cheap. I think the new trend, whether it's at the worker level or at the machinist level or at the higher level, if you want to attract good people, you have to have fewer people but better trained, better productive people and pay them more. Otherwise, you will not attract. And it's happening. If you see the salaries today, even in the manufacturing, it's a lot better than what it was yesterday. So basically, the talent and skill development is a very key part of this. Even the previous government had started on this, all the National Skill Development Corporation, all this, the concepts came earlier, they were found, started finding there. So in a way, the new government has got a good platform on which to implement many good ideas that were actually sown before. The other important thing, as I said, is the <coughs> operational efficiency and cost effectiveness. You've got to not be low cost, but high value. Even today, most of our Indian engineering centers, when they started 15 years to Bechtel or Floor or who are thought of it as low cost centers. No, it is really high value creation centers because the productivity at engineering level in India is superior to in, in the West. Because I always jokingly tell my customers when they still want to see some foreign office because they all like to go to London rather than come to Baroda or to Bombay. I mean, when they have to come and be there for six months to supervise our engineering. Every time the guy in London at Hammersmith goes out to smoke, you know, he's costing you $120, $150 an hour. The Indian fellow, even if he goes out to smoke, only costs you $40 an hour. So basically, our efficiencies are very high in this, this part of it. And lastly, collaboration and knowledge sharing. I think today, <coughs> the teamwork and collaboration is so important. And maybe this is one area which in good companies, it is more there in good states in India, it may be more there as a country, it may be a lot still to happen. And therefore, collaboration, knowledge sharing is the key of any great and endeavor. If I look back on the DRDO missions of even the name, Integrated Guided Missile Development Program, used to excite us. I'm not talking 82, 81, when Dr. Abdul Kalam used to come to our shop floor, when we started on the SLV program. So basically, you have to have that mission. You know? and, and that is how when we started on the advanced technology vehicle, which has now become the nuclear submarine. Again, we're not allowed to build the normal submarines, which are easier. But we were, thanks to DRDO, went into the nuclear submarine. Again, trying to do something of that level because, as I said, companies finally get excited about, and young people, of course, they get excited about salaries and ACPC and all, but they also get excited if they can see a bigger purpose and being the first of, to build the nuclear submarine, first to build the PSLVs which take took Chandrayaan, were all conceived at the ground level between DRDO and LNT and 
way back in 1984-85. So basically what I'm trying to say is this is going to be very important. The collaboration between very great institutes, whether in the private, public and companies among themselves, among other companies are going to be so important. So basically I think what is happening in aspirational mode, very well articulated by our Honorable Prime Minister and through various forums continuously, continuously, continuously. Now it has to hit the ground. It's a lot of policy reforms, enhancing the ease of doing business, both by removing red tape to red carpet, as he called, but also through systems of digitization, where online you can get your uh, approvals, online you could see transparency. And most important is the building of infrastructure. This is, I mean, very, very important, because without that, this country cannot reduce, uh, realize the great efficiency. And all these clusters of smart cities, where new way of thinking, new way of doing it comes into the picture, heavy investments in railways for moving freight, so that you don't only congest the roads, heavy investment in waterways, heavy investment in power, hopefully good investment in nuclear power when you cross some of the imp because for our country, all these are very important and it also builds manufacturing and infrastructure strength. And of course, thanks to him, Mr. Modi, now the leadership of India is again becoming global like it was in Pandit Nehru's time. It's a different angle. Now it's in a different angle. So I would just then, let's link it up because finally country is there, but we have all had more personal experiences, you know, and what makes leadership? as Dr. Baldev Raj said, what makes leadership, what makes people drive people in a positive way, where they themselves work late hours, they work tirelessly, not for the money only, that's maybe 20%, but work because they accomplish some great things. I always tell people, you can work in the big multinational, earn a lot of salary, but when you look back, when you retire, and somebody asks you, what did you contribute, your grandson asks you, I think you can get much more if you can work in where you can be a person who does the change and who also contributes to the country. So basically, we are fortunate. We, like, I was just uh, charmed yesterday. I was at uh, was at the Jadhapur uh, Bombay Chapter Alumni Association. I was asked to come as a give a talk and be a chief guest. And Mr. Shamal Gupta was there, who I used to know from a distance. I had not met him so much, but he's one of the doyens of Tatas and was just Tata son. So uh, he was telling how both Swami Vivekananda and Jamshedji Tata went on the same ship to uh, America in 1898. So I mean, that is when they had a lot of talks and that is how the, when he came back, uh, the Indian Institute of Science was, Tata Institute of Science was founded. I mean, for me, I, I didn't know that both traveled in the same ship and they got inspired by their own. One was a Entrepreneur, one was one of our greatest uh, thinkers and social uh, person. So this is what I think is important. It's collaboration between what I would call, we are all grease monkeys. He is a cerebral person, we talked about there, Raj, we have worked with him in the nuclear. Many of you, I find, are from the services. Many of you are from government. Many of you are from other institutions like Post and Telegraph and so on. So I think it's much more exciting to meet people outside your domain. In our own company, I always find that it's so much more fun to meet the finance guy and the HR guy in the evening function. One thing, I was joking, in our case, our finance guys sing very well. <laughs> Not many of our engineering guys sing so well. You know? So basically, each one has different talents, it comes. And I think they were very unique people, respect to humanity. But most important, when some things were not so great in India in thinking, we were very green, thanks to our Nordic heritage. Danes are always been very humble, low profile. If you see Dane, Nordic culture versus American culture or some other cultures, each culture has its own speciality. But one of the specialities which I learned later, which I didn't, I only grew with it, and that's how the culture of LNT has been built. But when I was invited about two years ago to give a talk to the Danish industry in Copenhagen, and their theme was, how, does, how do Nordic countries 
still remain competitive and relevant in today's competitive era. So I, I generally have a reasonably good student to prepare. So I went into what is this Nordic culture. Then I found there's a professor from Delft who has done a research on various types of cultures and how conceptually how American culture is very more dynamic, explosive, articulate, shorter. Whereas you have some of the other cultures, Japan, others have got their own consensus, teamwork, long term. Similarly, like the Danish culture is noted for low profile, there's not that much of difference between the prime minister and the normal fellow. There is so much of, it's a welfare state. So the, the high taxes, but a very good quality of life, but without it being very ostentatious. I don't think too many Danish people have weddings in Venice and in all those type of places. So it's a different culture. That's when, and I found the gentleman who's a research scholar was going to speak after me by accident. So basically, I think the culture of LNT has come from that type of background where people trust young people, people respect technology, engineering, and quality. I remember in our young days, I'm now talking about late 60s, which has to run Mr. Gunnar Hansen in our factory as the boss. And he used to always say, if it can be done in Denmark, why cannot it be done in LNT? I'm talking when we're doing switchgear design. We, you know, we developed our own design of switchgear. Nobody need, we could have imported the switchgear. They could have imported it. So basically, that spirit of enterprise innovation has to be there in the country, in the comp company. And I think in India, it, it did get generated. It is many of these places where technology was denied or the pride was there with leadership. It, it has blossomed. And the quality and customer satisfaction is so important. And of course, it comes with really empowering people and taking them forward. So if you say, what are the pillars in which a company moves or which a country will have to move, is basically you have to have this change to an innovation ecosystem, which is culturally, you have to change into that type of system, which recognizes innovation. And when you have innovation, you also have failures. It's easier to copy something which is already proven than the chance of failure is much less. When you want to develop something, but then you have to have the culture that pushes you, but also helps you during failure time. I mean, this culture, I'll tell you an example. In our very young days, the first level important interview when you became an officer from a trainee, itself, Mr. Hokla used to take part in the interview. Even our seniors take part, but this company becomes so big now. But that time he was the founder also. So I remember in my first interview when I was getting, so he was asking about a particular project many times. So I finally asked him, sir, but and I knew I had otherwise talked reasonably well. Why are you asking me this question so many times? He says, you know, do you still think it was so important for the company? I said, yes. He said, did you think we made good money? I said, I don't know because I was only having one part of the area. The marketing people used to know the price and all that. He said, no, we didn't make much money. But since you say it's going to have a long-term future for the company, good tuition fees. I mean, those are the exact words. So I think this is the culture on which if you don't grow, you can't grow technological companies, you know, especially when you grow it yourself. Then the human capital, multidisciplinary, knowledge intensive, global dimensions, because I think today it's a free world. And so anything you do in India also has to have scale. Now, if you can get the scale locally, fine, but mostly you'll have to get a scale locally and some amount beyond. And as I said, the governance is going to be so important. I mean, when you, yesterday, I, uh, there was a lecture by, before me by one Professor Bhattacharya, who's the, uh, from the Berlin School. Uh, and he's an ex-Indian product, now taught, uh, studied at Wharton. And, but he gave a very good dimension of CSR. And he's written a book also, which he said is available on flipchat.com. Concept of that book is this, which I'm also going to pick it up when I go back, is CSR. Now, how do CSR, if it's done very properly with passion, with the heart and with the clear objective of involvement, how it can also be a profit generator? That means, like he said that when 10 years ago, 
that Ben and Jerry is a famous ice cream chain in America. I also have eaten in Ben and Jerry at Memphis where my daughter lives. And that, but they do a lot of social uh, work, I'm told, equivalent to a corporate. So that man asked him, hey, since you do a lot of this marketing research, can you do some exercise and find, tell me whether the, these good things that we do, does it finally contribute in any extra profitability or sales to us? And so they did the research and they found, yes, because when two things are equal in price, and he's talking now a consumer product, but one has got this type of visibility in the market, then when you go, you somehow get led towards that. I mean, you can say it for Tata's, you can say it for LIT, you can say it for many other good Indian companies. That in a way you feel comfortable, somebody come, wants to buy a real estate, the best of real estate companies are there, but if by chance LNT is there, or even building it, maybe psychologically you buy. So basically, when you do it now in a more established ways to CSR, where you can have a focus, have a drive, and not just give money away, but do it, then it has. So this is the part, I would say, in governance, in terms of the CSR, in terms of corruption-free work, in terms of you know building the infrastructure. So basically, when we grew, as I said, we grew from the highest, the toughest thing, because that was the only thing that was made available to us, and that was the nuclear and the space, along with some part of process which was open. And then went to the ISRO and VRDO route, went into offshore with ONGC much later, but in a big way. And overnight, now when the economy has opened up, are building 1,000 megawatt turbines and supercritical boilers, all with within two to three years of deciding to go into it because the skills already came up through this route and now on to defense, which is going to be our biggest uh, foray uh, for us as we go forward. Now all those skills were built in the 80s, 3, 84 onwards when whatever was opened because of our skill and the only access was open to was through the DRDO at that time and to the Navy who was a little superior system of their own organization because they even that time had a naval design group under Captain Lohana. I set up the defense group hands-on so I have a little feel of the people. And then on the other side you had Admiral Sukul and others who were in acquisition. And then you had the third side and that is when we had Dr. Admiral Roy who came in parallel on the ATV program. That's the nuclear submarine program. So basically it is going to be an era where now the, the Army and the Air Force are also very independently doing it to NAL and the, so on, but now will become more important. So that's why we entered more the missile area, which was open through the DRDO route. But it's going to be a big play for all the new Indian manufacturing industry. In all this, if you want to do it, of course leadership has to be there, but leadership has to have a, his own HR feel, but you need a strong HR in an organization. Because finally, like you have engineering, you will have finance, human resources also very key. And of course, leadership themselves to be HR managers, HR people also should be business oriented. And I think what I have learned, because it's one of the things that I pursued and which we do across the company now, is how do you do change in very large numbers of people, but at one time and have a, a process for that. So this is something that I learned way back in the early 90s. There's a lady called Catherine Dan Miller in USA at that time she had written a book. And like we used the TQA movement for manufacturing, which was very much perfect for workmen, for machines, for the manufacturing. But when you have a lot of office staff and you have a lot of engineers, you have a lot of project managers, and how do you take various areas and drive that change, you know. So basically, all of us who are good, I mean, I'm not talking cynics, but people who have got a positive uh, way of looking at things to improve, you ha do have creative dissatisfaction. It's there in a group. If you have 100 good people in the group, maybe 10, 15, maybe cynics, 40 or 30 will be positively dissatisfied to do something and have a change. And there will be always a silent majority who will swing with the positive once you create a system. 
And therefore, if you have vision and you always know that you will have, should have constructive dissatisfaction and you are ready to take first steps in an organized manner, then the product of these three will overcome change. And this is the sort of concept. And when you want to do this, you do it, you can, we have done it in groups of 300, 350, and now as a company also in our workouts, we do it at 200 level. But, it, I mean, people abroad, depending on logistics and depending on the type of infrastructure you can create, you can do it for 400, 500 people at one time also. So you can drive one particular objective, you know, over three days and take it to the next level afterwards in terms of your action plans that you do. Because basically, and in that you try to create a microcosm of the group. It's not all seniors. And in the tables that you sit, you don't bring all the same people. You have senior, junior, finance, HR, engineering, lady, man, group. Now that you create microcosm, each group can really be a microcosm of your entity. And not, you get the younger boys up also, you get the elder wisdom also. But basically the concept, when you do all the large scale interactive processes is, you have all the top areas, then you, of course you have the change. But any one of them is missing, vision is missing, but you have most of that, then you'll have confusion. So like today Narendra Modi has great vision, but then you have to have all these other parts to make that change happen in India. Or the company, I'm not talking about a company. So same way you have vision, but you don't have great motivation. Then you have all skills, but the change will be slow. But then you have vision and motivation, but very often you don't have the skills. You don't have the HR organization and the internal organization to manage such things, then you would still have anxiety because things are not happening. Although everybody is so excited, everybody has a vision, you have resources, action plan. Same way if you have all this but you don't have resources, then you have frustration. It happens many times that people don't give the resources. And then finally if you do, do all this but you don't have action plan, not just for those two, three days, but later on to monitor it and then have action plans in-house, then again you will not have a great start. This is just what uh, our chairman, I remember, said in our first film, which was, we made in the early 70s, Mr. Hoke Larson, who was a great uh, humanitarian and chemical engineer, but really uh, all around, he used to love art, we are some of the best when I see Thaya Mehta's painting going to crores and crores, we have so many Thaya Mehta paintings in our office and because whole class and collected them. And so, in those days I've met Thaya Mehta, they were all normal people, they were not famous, but he encouraged art like many of the Tata's people and all and brought them up. Buildings must be there, missionaries must be there, but without people it's all nothing. People are our only real assets. So this is I think the crux of whatever we are talking about. So, as I said, I would, uh, I mean, I'm just somebody like you only, no different. We all have our problems when we work, when we are in the work, but I'd be exceedingly happy to interact with you and take as many questions as you have. It's not only that you value yourself, you have to value your people, you have to value the skills, you have to value the culture, you have to grow amidst challenges. There are a number of nuggets, and I'm sure many of you would have some interesting questions to ask from Mr. Krishna Murthy Venkatramanan. Please feel free. Sir, you can come here and be seated. I'm okay, sir. Yeah, just introduce yourself, sir, so I have a little connection. Also. I am Girish Dikshit. I am from ADA, manufacturer of flight combat aircraft. Yeah, yeah, I am sir. group director for the flight control system development. Because we learned Katia from you, you know, those days in Koti, Hari, Narayana. That time one of my old, I should look, out, look up to him in Hyderabad called Murli Salator. He came back also in that group. In, in, uh, so he was, when I was in school, he was much senior to me. And so I have a great warm memories of your ADA. Yes, tell me, sir. Pardon? Yeah. In your slide, Make in India, foreign exchange earning and employment generation, those are the two key factors. Why you have not highlighted in that slide, sir? I no, just no. Want My to know. thing was to give the concept. You see, finally, the employment factor we have highlighted in a big way. I mean, but the foreign exchange earning is something that you save foreign exchange when you substitute and you make when you export, you know. So basically, 
it is not eliminated for the sake of elimination, but it's part of that theme. But in the theme, I have given more importance to the the environment, the skills, and the development. Obviously, foreign exchange is a very important uh, element. But initially, in the Make for India campaign, I think it's going to be more saving the foreign exchange as a start, rather than like how Raghuram and Rajan very nicely mentioned. But it's there, sir. It's very much there. It's not. We not uh, can't capture that thing, the whole thing, in one shot. I'm Dr. Sachimurthy from Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research, Kalpakam. Sir, uh, your talk is wonderful, and uh, in fact, it's on a very, very important topic uh, like <coughs> making India, which uh, we have been hearing for the last seven, eight months. And this is certainly a very good concept uh, for a country like ours, where uh, we have. The great human assets, funds crunch. Everything is available in the country. Resources are available, but uh, but what did we really do for uh, making uh, in India happen so far? What did you? What did we do uh, to okay. make in India happen so far? Well, as I said, uh, there has to be a driver from the top in terms of uh, you know wanting it, which we have now. Maybe if I look at it, uh, the speed, project management in whatever we do is going to be very important because if at all we have failed in the past on some very important missions, it is only where to some extent our execution for whatever reasons because of the processes and others was slow. But I think today, sir, if uh, the, the concept which is there, already it has been done in nuclear, it has been done in so many other areas as we mentioned, will be, is being facilitated by, like he's mentioned, you need to employ 50 million people, you know, from, from 10 million, 11 million people today to 50 million by 2022. We need also heavy exports today, you'll be surprised, I was, uh, you must be knowing it, but I, for me to surprise when I read our imports of these electronics consumer goods is only next to our import of oil. So, I mean, some areas which are going to be continuously consumed is not sustainable. We have to have a very strong hardware industry in that area. Obviously, then you can't overnight become a Taiwan, but if you don't have it and you're going to import the phones, you're going to import, it's not sustainable because at some point it will hit in terms of whether you can afford it. So, there is a uh, I think a move to make it happen and I believe the important part is investment. A lot of investment has to come from abroad also because it's not how was Singapore built. Singapore was built with most of the investment coming from abroad and not that they, they are rich people there. They are allowed the immigration also from abroad of skills. So, I think this is how it will happen. So, the FDI is going to be very important whether you like it or not, not through debt but through equity, because only the equity stays here. The big amounts you get through debt, in the slightest some change, it will all fly back. Of course, debt is also required, but I am saying you need lot of equity also. So, this is the background, I would think. So. Any more questions, yeah, yes, lady. I am from NIC. From? I am from Life Insurance Corporation. How nice. Sir, you are our biggest stakeholder in our <laughs> company. of doing business and building infrastructure, I think that seems to be our biggest uh, challenge because we've got so many environmental issues. We have NGOs who talk about how things can't be done and then you have China which is already having so much more to offer. So how can in this circumstance make, make in India, I mean, it seems to be a very big uh, challenge. And yeah, it is a challenge. It is a challenge. That yeah. Lowest stand, I think yeah, so that's that's why it comes the base. If you don't have foundation, the building collapses. Yeah. You know, that's so it will happen. See, basically, the uh, enhancement ease of doing business has been seen now as a very important part. And obviously, a lot of it has to go through the process uh, of also doing more and more digital clearances, so that people can see on your computer 
where it is and where it's not. I think so. Basically, the policy reform, there will be some opposition. Obviously, you need a healthy opposition, not the people who run away from the parliament and prevent the parliament from operating. But I'm sure good some policy reforms will happen, whether it's labor, whether it's taxation, GST, and so on and so forth. And the building infrastructure, if you have these two, foreign money will come to build infrastructure because there is too much of money and money has no value unless you spend it. So the, as long as you give a return. So I think, so basically you are right ma'am ma that that is a challenge but like he's mentioned in his talk also, challenges only give opportunities and we are hopeful that this time it will happen. Happen much better than before, let's put it. Yeah. So I'm Sai, sir, <clears throat> from uh, Indian Army. I'm based in Lucknow, Central Command. I just, uh, apart from a lecture we have uh, we just heard, what is the action plan that uh, your company has done for making India a success story? The, we have uh, talking of uh, the baseline policy reforms, enhancing case, yeah. doing business, building infrastructure. Uh, but we do find a lot of big companies, though they are, there must be some action plan at your end. Yeah, I'll tell you. Good, good question previous one. So basically, you know, let me give you a real story. In 1982-83 is when we saw beyond Powai. Powai is where we started. It's our Mecca, Medina, or Tirupati for us. The areas that we were not in at that time, in 82-83, but we knew something about it was because of our DRDO connection prior to that was, and the ISRO connection prior to that, was defense. So I was in R&D at that time and I was, you know, in, as part of my own aspiration, I wanted to come back to the business. I started in the manufacturing and engineering and then went to R&D. And in R&D at that time, we had done a lot of work on tribology because of our cement background. We had done a lot of work on heavy machinery and gearboxes because again of the cement background. And we knew metallurgy quite well, we knew stress analysis quite well, we knew vibration analysis quite well because we were making atomizers for the spray dryers and we were doing analysis for nuclear. We were doing automated welding for SLVs. We were doing fixturing for PSLVs. So basically, that's the time when we had some seniors also who said, hey, what is, we are building this huge facility in Hajira. We don't have an industrial license to make really the things it's supposed to make, like platforms or big uh, uh, <coughs> defense equipment. But we had, thanks to atomic energy, they gave us the license to build Hajira on nuclear to make the 700 megawatt programs. So we took the risk that we will develop these hot skills that we have, which came from another discipline, looking at defense long before all this made for India program and all, just on the inspiration of DRDO, Dr. Abdul Kalam and Kasturi Rangan and all these people who were there around with whom we used to interact to apply those skills. So that is how we formed a defense design and development group, distinct, but come from J.D. Patel, who is now our uh, leader in the defense. He was my boy who was designing um, cement plant gears. He had nothing to do with defense, but he was a high-end mechanical engineer. And that is how when we first went to get on to DRDO to make the uh, multi-barrel rocket launcher prototype order we got, we got the order for the BMP conversion with the Nag missile. We got the order for the Prithvi launcher. So we started on defense as a part of a, a, a excitement for our engineers. Business with DRDO, which was small. It was not big compared to what it will be now. And that is how the a lot of stream of, now we have maybe having 2,000 people working, high-end engineers on defense who are on the ATV program, or now the third Ariant equivalent. We are on the radar and other things. I'll show you some photographs at the end. So basically, we took that call on our own. 
there was no Narendra Modi, there was no something. We felt that this was an area which we have competence. We are a nation builder. It excites our people. Let's go for it. And that today when the takeoff happens, we are reasonably positioned. So, so even if when foreign companies come, they would like to collaborate with us in some areas when 49 percent equity comes. So this is what we did. It was nothing to do with make in India. It started in 84 because we were making India. I am Man. I am come from Kota, Indian Army. Uh, my question is on the human resource. I very well agree with you, and all of us will vouch for that. That uh, one important aspect for any good manufacturing is the human resource. Though we have about 60 percent, 65 percent of our today's population of the age group of young, uh, 22, 40 years of age, and they are they make a good resource. One point you already brought out was the training and skill development, which we lack highly. Sir. But second major aspect which I feel need to improve and take years to come by is the self-discipline and the dedication of human being as such. Sir. Today, this is the same uh, age group which will drive rashly, which will not give indicator, which will park absurdly on the road or they will throw their house mark into an empty plot next to your house because it doesn't belong to them. So how does this character come into this uh, human resource that we can become good? Uh, well, I think uh, it's a very nice question. First of all, I think that's to yeah, I grew up in Sikandrabad, Hyderabad, so it's an army town. So I've seen how simple guys go into NDA, maybe doing many of those things like that, and they come out of NDA as such a disciplined officer. But the institution built it. Many of us who studied in good schools we were built by that. So I think this is an so when we talk of skill development, it is not just the skill, but the attitudinal part is also going to be very important. There has to be a cultural change when there is uh, severe recognition for people who do good things and people should be punished for bad things. And it's a huge country. Today we have learned some of the bad habits. When I go to Ceylon and we do construction, before the muck goes out from the thing on the trailer, you have to hose the tires. You have to tie the muck and then it goes. They also are British. They learned that. Here the fellow will spill the whole road and go, or he'll spill the whole road and come. So I think a combination of cultural change has to happen, which will happen. Today you see in a way that even in a smaller place, when you do something well, whether it's a metro in Delhi or the, a mall in Bombay, some of people behave well there. They don't dirty that place, you know. And I think some of these things of Swachya Bharat and all, you look at it not as a cynic, but in a genuine way, all these things have to come. Amir Khan's programs on the TV. It takes time, but it's not that it can't happen. It has to happen by a combination of some strong discipline of punishment also. The park in the wrong place, the fine should not be 250 rupees, should be 2,500 rupees. So some things, the deterrence like that should come. But it will happen, it's being a huge one and a half billion dollar uh, country. But it, institutions make it, role models make it, social NGOs make it, you know, your own societies make it. It's, so it will happen, sir. I mean, that's how good institutions have been built, whether it is your fantastic uh, defense services where simple people in the village, the same jat who must be the, sitting in the village and talking something else, but once he enters, your own services, and he becomes a part of Rajputana rifles or whichever he is. Then he goes through, meets people from NDA cadre who lead from the front. Our own services, the officers lead from the front. That's why we have more casualties in our Indian services than we have in many other services. And change comes. I mean, so I think one has to take pride in many of these very. What, what I found, change happens apart from the real things. Role model has to be there. But how many times you keep on? giving that message. Uh, leader has to keep on giving the message, not to become boring, but he should do it at various times to various sectors and generally mean it. He should also practice that. It will happen, but it's not going to be easy. But it's not that it's not going to happen. What's your name, I'm sir? I'm Dr. Manu Korula. I'm from DRDO, right now with Naval Systems at Vishakapatna, NSTL. Sir, one... Uh, it's a question and uh, it is something which is uh, I'm often facing. 
Um, L&D is doing uh, manufacturing and many a time they find difficulty in sourcing material for manufacturing. Now this is a problem uh, with any new innovation that is coming up. You find it very difficult to source the material. And now in the country if you innovate a material, now if you produce it the production cost is prohibitively high and you don't find many takers for that material. So it has to be very limited production which is not economic. So um, if L&D goes with you know that material and produce some standard uh, products which could be utilized in the uh, general uh, arena other than defense or specialized products then uh, probably such materials could be made affordable. But what we see is that uh, uh, the major industries who are capable of doing that, they are not coming up with uh, such popular system. Uh, for example, uh, any of the uh, uh, utility systems that is used you know, in the consumer uh, market. Once that is not done, uh, never will have an opportunity to uh, grow the materials science and materials production. Mitani they produce and there is a big queue, you have to wait for two, three years. And now I find L&D also many systems what we have asked for. The material inspection itself is taking so much of time that you know we are not able to meet the schedules. So is there a plan with L&D in the uh, years to come to develop materials because that is essential and uh, now I don't know, I, I mean they are also finding it difficult to source it from many of the establishment that is available in India. And another one is foundry. <laughs> no, let me uh, see for example the nu nuclear forging shop that we have set up, right now it's bleeding us because the nuclear industry for the temporarily is down because of the Fukushima incident, is to make nuclear forgings for the 1300 megawatt reactors also. And uh, that, so that was our first foray into, and it's got a foundry with it, it's a melting shop actually, and then the forging. So in a limited way, where it think, we think we make sense, we have gone in, but at the moment it is actually set up as a joint venture with the Nuclear Power Corporation. But right now, both of us are losing money on that because of the unfortunate incident, but it will change, I'm sure it will change. Coming to the other side, like we did collaborate with Nuclear Fuels Complex in Hyderabad to make those seamless tubes, which we use on the private side. And as somebody said, of export and all, once we go into India, make in India, Midani and all has got a lot of potential of scale. One lot of things happen, you, you know. So basically, I mean, see, everything has to have demand. It has to have scale. And many of them will be, now initially Midani was set up to make the Marajing steel and all those important, I grew up in Sikandabai, I used to watch Tamankar. I know Dr. Arunachalam quite well because he was like an idol to me when I was entering IIT and all. So basically, the uh, uh, it, it has to come in that ecosystem. So today, Midani came up of the self-reliant system because nobody would give you those materials in the world. So obviously, at the moment, it may not have scale, but it will have that scale as we go up. But LNT, I don't think, will become a long term in a big way into material science manufact uh, manufacture would be material science user and yes forgings we have set up there's a huge facility costing 2800 crores it's a mini steel plant because you, you melt the scrap add the ingredients have a furnace make high quality materials we made it fighter and all with very very poor low trace elements and then uh, you know, make the products. So it's in that category. Sir, I'm Nalini Ratnam from LIC. You had mentioned that uh, at the moment in India we don't have any national occupational standards. For uh, for this manufacturing uh, skilled workman, yes. Yeah. So how do we, I mean, overcome this? No, that's what is happening, man. That this uh, skill council, uh, which was set up with the Dilip Chennai and uh, you have on the top level people like Ramadar and all, was set up to make this national external occupation standard, not only in manufacturing of heavy engineering, but in retail, healthcare, and all. So that is going on. This is an initiative which started, I think, about 10 years ago. This council was formed almost seven, eight years ago. And now individual industry associations are forming the verticals. 
you are right it was all informal standards there was no uh, occupational standards certified by one single national agency no is, is a result of this this mushrooming of all our uh, educational institutions you know all such no standards. this is not education this no. is now i'm talking of skill a lot of skill development trainers like yeah. here also lot manipal guild in karnataka is a famous training academy this is more at the vocational level vocational but we do have a lot of vocational institutions in place which probably will not conform to these illala so what will happen now as part of our job we will interact with some of the institutions they have to appoint uh, take that curriculum and if they take that curriculum and have that training and the people pass that exam then they get a certificate you're right it is to uniform it absolutely correct each one has got his own murti from uh, department of post sir yeah hello sir um, uh, will not the uniform development of the country should be the first criteria because which one sir uniform development of the country yeah we have pockets of excellence maybe you, you also know the conditions in bimaru state jharkhand chatisgarh and sure sir unless we try to bring them on a level whatever we do about development make in india and all will it not further aggravate making a two class of people one is excellent in See, every aspect yeah. i don't think continue to remain yeah. the same no there are two things i i am not a you know policy expert i'm only a normal simple chap but the concept is something like this finally in a concept like india to grow you have to have competition between states unless you have in over life if you don't have competition you don't grow so i think so one of the things of having states growing faster than others is to create competition of trying to copy like today the vibrant gujarat started the trend now it is everywhere people want to have industry can go to america and all states go and north carolina and south carolina governors main job is to get industry to that's why india manufacturing has come back to america it it is it has vanished like except germany in europe in italy it has vanished in europe but in america it has come back so partly it is that and i don't think the government is totally ignoring the inclusive part but the fact is where there is talent where there is uh, a sort of growth uh, replicate it in smart cities whatever you have learned here create the infrastructure corridors because we are still building the corridor from north to gujarat where three smart cities are going to come up dolera and two more so you have to create that, those vehicles also where you already have space your talent and that will be a replica for others and obviously the competition will come uh, in terms of people wanting to emulate or young people thanks to the tv and all that want are same everywhere so, but i don't think in the way when you say you want to develop these things you are ignoring i'm not saying that you know is there be no there will be some I'll, way you look at it one it can be competition like the whole of india comes to bombay from bihar and up and you know and if but as today they are all saying the why can't you create in up and bihar the same thing so they don't have to come here so there's some pressure on them also to do it so i think it's a big social issue but unless you have pockets of excellence and grow those pockets to become geographically bigger and bigger and bigger i guess you won't have examples on which to right at the way everywhere you sink the money you know and I, but I, i i am not an expert <laughs> but this is my own feeling is i think it's good to have competition among states it's good to locate things where the growth can happen faster as where fdis will come if if there is law and order in some state which doesn't have it if there is proper infrastructure then people will go there also but having said that it's not as simple as what i said yeah. yes sir Sir, in the 1950s onward, the self-reliance in many challenging technologies, as you have highlighted, became a glue for politicians, academics, research, and industry to work for a common cause of the country. In fact, the dividends of that we are showing, and I sincerely believe it's so more and more 
yes, as they go along. Today, according to you, what is the glue or bond which would drive the future aspirations of the country? Because unless we have a glue or bond, I believe, even with the best of the assets and whatever supply chain we may talk about, we may not achieve collectively for the country. Right. We may create excellence. So, what is your perspective on that? I think uh, one of the major clues has to be now the national pride of India being a, uh, a global, uh, not only economic power, but a, a power which has some influence in the world and pride. And thanks to, as I said, people who did it in the past in technology and teaching and professions and research, and in the more recent times because of IT and banking and being the leaders in their own adopted countries. Now into political leadership, whether it is Bobby Jindal or whether it is so many others in America. So you have to have that national pride. If you go to China and all, which I have gone many times, thanks to that leadership over the last 15 years, while well, it may have done many not so good things also, maybe. But there are pride, you know, that you want to be something. And that is where I think a little bit like the Chandrayaan mission, people may question the success, very low cost, so nobody questions, but people could have questioned why you want to go to Mars, why you want to go to the moon, but you need, like Kennedy did it, you need some visible things. So in that way, I am no great expert on it, but we are building now the Vallabhai Patel statue in uh, Gujarat. It's going to be much higher than Statue of Liberty, when anybody sees it, you know, for a season, it gives a certain, you can say it's a wasteful expedition on site. But you need a combination of, and I think the pride that India should realize its true power. And one thing good that has happened is, when Japan realized its true power, we were not very well connected in that. And poor Japan had just lost the world war and all that, so they were also subdued. They did all the progress but kept themselves. But when China has come up, it has created a lot of comparisons to India. And why can't we, they are our neighbor. And for, so I think uh, the glue, as you rightly said, sir, is technology. First of all, national pride. And Indians have proved now in the new age technology. They are, I mean, the Amazon wants to invest here. So Mr. Jack Ma wants to invest here. So that area is going to still be a great driver. So far, we were building technology for outside. All the retail industry in America is working on Indian software. All the banks in the world are working on Indian software. Hopefully through this, when India grows, a lot of it will come to India. But the glue would be national pride, national leadership, and the sort of uh, ambition that we also want our place in the sun. And the younger generation are becoming more entrepreneurs, more people who want to get rid of the old past in, and bring back some of the old idealism. I hope it happens, sir. Can you see the subsequent uh, question is that in the, <coughs> at the first half of 20th century, we saw complete leaders. There may be latent leadership, but one doesn't really experience that kind of leadership. Is it that it's not made visible or it is not there or how to create that kind of, because unless we create, and we don't want many leaders, even if we can create 100 leaders in this country of that magnitude, I think we'd have addressed many of the odds. Even social scientists like Vivekananda, this means we're, 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 what's, what's gone wrong in creating that kind of leadership? No, see, sir, actually, in areas which the growth took place, leaders have come. I mean, I would consider Narayan Murthy as in that you know, type of uh, uh, level, creating a company from himself with five people is a great thing. And so wherever IT grew, so it created many more uh, visible leaders who built great things. Some other industries did not maybe grow so much, maybe so it created fewer visible leaders. But I think leadership and uh, growth comes together, uh, I'm not talking about industry angle, and it in the thought leadership and in science, I guess, to some extent, as I said, that from, as I've seen in my own eyes, 80 to 90 onwards, we were not, neither here nor there. So maybe that's why that many new bhavas and all didn't come up in the scientific thing to that extent to show, but I would consider some of the people who came out of DRDO, 
and ISRO also of uh, you know of that but only the advantage is those early days you had a anchor like Nehru now if you have an anchor like Modi for some time then many of these leaders will show up much more because of and provided he has some of those good qualities of handling people that Nehru had you know so basically it's like that I would say sir so it will happen when there is growth there is desire there is a sort of a goal that blue as you rightly uh, said so it will happen I believe I am sure about it you can't have growth without leaders and you cannot have technology without technology leaders so I think the next level whoever comes has to come in that speed you know Yeah. I'll just uh, show you uh, just a few photographs at the end because a lot of they are all international level of uh, technology. talked of metallurgy we don't make materials but I think we know how to handle a very wide range of materials these are of course all the areas of Dr. Balzeraj you have taught us a lot on this similarly you talked of we export 70 percent of our critical equipment because as I said it's only Germany Italy even Korea and all don't make some of the high-end equipment nor do China make for export, they make for their own country. They're all international size and scale. This is an area which over the next 10 years, once we get over the nuclear liability and get over because the foreign uh, in technologies have been promised to some plants, so a lot of building will happen here. So this is a real area we learnt our fabrication thanks to the nuclear industry. And fast breeder thanks to Baldera Saab and all your Bhavani people are here. We did all the stuff there. This is the other area we were denied entry for a long time but now we have done some big things here. And I said this is the area for the future. All this first prototypes came in in 1985 when I was handling different that is why the speed has been slow in India, you know, because the funds were not there. And DRDO was always kept as a sideline. But it was all DRDO jobs. Now the bigger versions are coming. Many of these are now on all our uh, warships. This is where the future is. Now they have got this make and buy, you know, and... Uh, so we are into these programs in a big way. We built a shipyard on our own, which is right now bleeding. But now defense, when it opens up, it will be a major strength. Again, this is aluminium, fast interceptor boats, the type that caught hold of that boat that came from Pakistan recently. And of course, this is a real great thing that we have done with DRDO, all with young engineers, but with modern technology. We have virtual reality here laboratory we have done it differently from what Mazagon Dock or any of the very contemporary without visiting any foreign yard of course this is, this is what was the old days of SLV you know <laughs> single ones then we made PS uh, augmented SLV then we made PSLVs now we made GSLVs I mean it's very difficult that all this, it has taken more time because maybe of government bureaucracy not allowing the scientists to have enough powers or whatever it is, I don't know. But these are things that were what Dr. Avinash Chandra and all these people did. And this is our latest uh, contribution in the Chandrayaan mission. We had the PSLVs, we had the radar, we had a lot of that. Now, these are things that excite the young fellows to stay. I mean, by itself, the value is not as big as what you would have got building a road but I think excitement comes and then the scale has to come hopefully now so we don't make noise but we are the biggest defense 
private sector company. We don't keep publishing the papers every day. But people who are in the business know. Thank you. Pleasure to give uh, the vote of thanks. Such an inspirational and wonderful start to the uh, 29th annual program for senior executives. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Shri Bikke Venkatramanan for what I think was an inspirational and uh, wonderful talk, which has I think set the tone for the rest of the program. I also would like to thank all the participants for such an interactive session and do would request to continue in the same uh, fervor. And I would also, also like to thank Dr. Baldev Raj for his uh, uh, and a thoughtful uh, welcome address.